with regards to general revelation, right? We're talking about not specific revelation given to Israel, but general revelation that that mankind as a whole uh, can enjoy. The agnostic, atheistic, skeptical, and pagan world at large can never comprehend God or his nature due to the fact that it has rejected the notion of a creator God to begin with, right? The world at large, the world in general, rejects God altogether. This is different from rabbinic Judaism, right? Religious Judaism uh, accepts God, at least the notion that there is a God. Um, Orthodox Judaism at least does, right? I know some forms of of maybe reform and reconstruction uh, Judaism, liberal types of Judaism, uh, mystical forms of Judaism, whatever, perhaps say, you know, the Bible's just not really, uh, the Word of God is really just a collection of stories that are designed to kind of um, give us kind of chicken soup for the soul, as it were. Um, But uh, there are forms of Judaism who reject the notion of a real God. They really don't really believe in God. They're, they're, they're wholeheartedly agnostic or, or atheistic in their approach, even though they're, they're, they are rabbinic Jews or they are heritage Jews. But generically speaking, the world at large has their own competi- competing religions or non-religious perspectives, right? The agnostic, the atheistic, the skeptical, and the pagan. And I, th- those are very broad terms, so this is not exhaustive. But they can never comprehend God or his nature through the fact that they've rejected basic wholesale the idea that God is the creator to begin with. And this is a position that Paul describes and articulates in his letter to the book of Romans. Re- look at these uh, passages here. Let me just read down through uh, these uh, short uh, verses. Starting in verse 16 of Romans chapter 1, Paul says, quote, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Right? That sets the context. Believers from both Jews, Jewish and Gentile people groups can experience not just the power of God through the gospel, but can ultimately begin to experience the nature of God and understanding who he is through this gospel message. He continues in verse 17, For in it, speaking of the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it is written and then he quotes the Tanakh the righteous shall live by faith right quoting Habakkuk and so what Paul's beginning to explain to Jews and Gentiles is that the gospel is the good news to unsaved man it's good news to unregenerate man but it's this good news that not only includes the revelation of Messiah Yeshua right the, 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 the man of salvation for both Jew and Gentile, but within the gospel, we begin to be exposed to the um, understanding of the nature of God, not just from the righteousness perspective, but from God's own nature itself. And and Paul uh, elaborates, he says, for the wrath of God, right? So now we we begin to sag into the nature of God, for the wrath of God, right? First, he talked about the power of God. Then he talked about the righteousness of God, and all of these are related to the gospel, right? The power of God and the righteousness of God. But now he's going to start talking about the wrath of God, which is part of the nature of God, because the gospel contains with it both good news and bad news. The good news is, if you believe in Jesus, you you join the righteousness of God. You, you take on the righteousness of God. But the bad news is the opposite. And so that's what Paul's going to start giving us now, the one-two punch of his, of his gospel message, right? The good news and the bad news. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against who? against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, right? This is the agnostic, the atheistic, the skeptical, and the pagan that I mentioned earlier, the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, now watch what Paul says, who by their unrighteousness oppress the truth. So they don't believe that God is Trinity because they can't understand God. They reject God and therefore they're going to reject the revelation of God. Paul continues in verse 19, for what can be known about God, right? Notice the discussion is about the nature of God, not just the gospel and the, and his righteousness and his wrath, but now we're talking generically about God's nature. What can be known about God is plain to them, right? How? How is it plain to them? How is the nature of God, which would include the gospel of God, how is it made known to the unregenerate of mankind? Because God has shown it to them, right? That's what Paul says. So they really have no excuse. And Paul's going to say this here in a moment. In verse 20, he says, for his invisible attributes, and we're talking about uh, a wide swath of, of 
topics here when we talk about his invisible attributes, but I certainly believe that this would include his triune nature when we talk about his invisible attributes. The fact that the Word of God existed in eternity past with God and as God, and then incarnated to become the Son of God in flesh, Jesus, Yeshua from Nazareth. This would be this would be included in his invisible attributes. How can the Word of God take on human flesh, right? So his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, right, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. How? In the things that have been made. So the creation itself is a testimony to the, the not just the generic nature of God, but even to the inner nature and the power of God as we can begin to um, um, uh, uh, apprehend it uh, culminating in the gospel of God and and the power of, of the Son of God himself. But we have to start, Paul uh, explains or challenges, with the belief that God is, right? The writer to the book of Hebrews is going to tell us that they that believe in God, that come to God, must uh, believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. We have to start with um, a belief in God and allowing God to begin to shape our thoughts and understanding of him to where we can begin to make a conscious decision that Jesus is the Messiah that we are in desperate need of, whether we even realize it or not. So Paul continues, so they, speaking of unregenerate mankind, kind, right, the unrighteous people, the ungodly people who suppress the truth that is there, but they suppress it. They are without excuse, meaning on judgment day, God's going to be able to have a dialogue with them and remind them of his invisible attributes, right? Remind them of his gospel, remind them of his righteousness, remind them of his son. And they can't look at God and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, God, I don't know who you are. I don't know who your son is. I don't know anything about this gospel. I don't know anything about this righteousness. I don't know anything about your invisible attributes. I don't know who you are. Who are you? They, they will have no excuse. Why? Because God can then remind them of his eternal power and divine nature that was clearly perceived since the creation of the world in the things that God has made. So innately, unregenerate man in the back of his mind knows that as he looks around him at the signature of creation, at the order in creation, at the order of the universe, both from the um, micro to the macro, from the, the expanse of the universe uh, at a larger level to putting the universe under the microscope, he comes to a he he must he knows in the back of his mind he's got this itch that he can't scratch that there's something very orderly about all of this. How could this have just come to be? All right. In verse 21, Paul says, for although they knew God, right? And this, is, of course, is a, is, a, is a head knowledge of God. This is not a salvific knowledge of God. Otherwise, it would not have resulted in the rejection of God and the worship of, of the creature. So this is, a, this is a superficial, it's a lip service knowledge of God. It's a, it's a, it's a book knowledge of God. It's, it's an academic knowledge of God. But it certainly is not a salvation knowledge of God. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, right? If it was salvific knowledge, then they would honor him as God. But the fact that they don't honor him as God is pretty proof that this is only head knowledge. This is just a, 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 a what we might call um, man's own, uh, um, uh, you know, materialistic, uh, not materialistic, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? His humanistic, that's the word I'm looking for, his humanistic uh, description of God. So the, his knowledge of God. For although he knew God, he didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him, right? This is because he doesn't actually know God, at least from his heart and level. He doesn't know. His heart doesn't know God. His head maybe knows about God, but his heart doesn't. Um, but instead, Paul said, they became futile in their thinking, right? And their foolish hearts were darkened. And the last result, claiming to be wise, they became fools and thus become full circle. With regard to general revelation, they are foolish when it comes to uh, understanding Trinity because... Um, They've rejected God, and so therefore God has left them in the state of being foolish. And then lastly, in, in closing... I'm